Hilmar, who's completely set the stage uh, for what I'm going to talk about now, and so I feel like I'm already preaching to the converted, which is great. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about researchobject.org. Um, it's a project that I'm currently involved in, but it has a long history um, going back within our particular research group and, and, and a number of large collaborations, um, including projects such as Methodbox and Workflow Forever, which some of you already know about here in the audience. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the start. In the start, I'm going to split the talk into about two different halves. The first part of the talk is going to be talking a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of research objects. Then I'm going to talk a little bit more about real-world examples of how research objects are now being used in the wild, so to speak. OK, so as I said, I'm going to talk a bit about the nuts and bolts of research objects. And um, what it is, is it, it's, it's basically a framework for being able to bundle, exchange, and link scattered resources and assets that might be around the web or uh, that you use in your day-to-day -day, um, work in the lab. So you can take these um, publications data, results, workflows, slides, metadata, logs, codes, um, Docker, whatever, you, whatever you're using, and uh, that's a Docker clang there for the research, for the, for the Twitter community there, by the way. And uh, bundle that all up um, into something that, which can be linked, is executable, discoverable, and reproducible. <coughs> so when we were working out how to be able to do this, then there was a bit of a desiderata about what it might be required in, or, in order to make this possible. Uh, the main thing is that we should do the least possible and the simplest feasible, because then that makes it so that uh, everybody else can use it. So how do, how do research objects work? So it's a, basically a, a container. Uh, the container contains, at, at its basic level, as a research object bundle, um, uh, uh, an organized uh, container of zip files. Um, or it can be uh, Docker images. Uh, we're also working with another group uh, which is using Bagit, which is popular with the um, library uh, community. Or it can just be links to things on the web. Uh, there's also catalogs and commons. Um, and some platforms that are also supporting research objects. So going, going back to the container, we, what, what, we, what we like to do with the container is be able to have a manifest of the things that are inside this container, whether real or imagined. Um, and this describes the aggregate resources and their annotations and provenance. So yeah, the, 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 the manifest itself has to be constructed. So that, that construction of that manifest um, has things about the identification. I'll show you an example just uh, shortly, which includes things like an ID, title, creator, status, uh, the things that it aggregates. So um, the, the, the list of things that you're trying to put into that container and some annotations about those things that you're aggregating, the, the assets that you're aggregating. Um, <clears throat> there's a manifest description as well, and we can there's, do things like uh, have a profile, uh, which allows you to have a um, checklist of what should be there, and this can get more and more detailed. I won't go into that, um, but suffice to say, there, there's lots more information about that. So I've put up um, what this kind of manifest might look like if you had a look inside the set of get down to a little bit of the nuts and bolts. So. We've got an ID there which go, links uh, a DOI on, on Zenodo. You can use any kind of ID to describe um, the research object itself. Uh, when it was created, when it was assembled, who created it, preferably using some kind of resolvable ID again, like an ORCID ID. Um, the kinds of things it aggregates. So we've got down here, for example, um, something that might be in the, in the zip bundle that we're actually putting actually into the, into the container itself, which is a, a specimen uh, .bam file. Uh, that might conform to a specific um, BAM file standard or, or, or file format. Um, then there might be a blog as well that you've in decided to include uh, about that particular um, BAM file and who authored that blog, um, some more information like a workflow that's related uh, to processing that BAM file um, with some provenance and some history as well about, about the, uh, the workflow itself. Then there's some annotations. The annotations down here at the bottom uh, relate uh, to the sequence or specimen BAM file uh, with some, maybe some properties that are well structured in a, in a JSON uh, file format. So I won't go into too much more about that, but suffice to say, um, the, the main principles, as I've discussed, is that uh, a research object should have identity uh, of the object and the things which it refers to. Um, so unique names and identifiers for those things and use some mechanism of aggregation to be able to group those things together, whether or not they're out on the web 
or actually in the container itself that you're choosing to ship around. And it should also provide metadata about those things and how they relate to one another that can be quite detailed. So, for example, if you're providing a, a transcript transcriptomic data file, then you might want to make that Miami compliant, for example, and provide the full checklist of information that's required for a particular file of that format. Okay, so if you want to get tooled up, <coughs> I'm not going to go, I said I was going to split the talk into two halves, I'm going to talk about real world examples, but we are starting to create um, uh, more detailed information, uh, research object tutorials about how you can go away and start to construct these types of things. It's on Git, so you can contribute to it yourself if you have particular expertise or if you've used them in anger and you want to say, put feedback uh, to the group as well. Uh, we're very much likely to be able to contribute to that. It is a community effort. Okay, so I said I'd talk about some real world examples now, so I'm going to move on to the second half of the talk. Um, I've got a number of examples here. We've got the review to reproduce example that was talked uh, about yesterday by Alejandra. Some workflow runs, file commons, uh, capturing, describing Docker in images for CERN, uh, Fairdom, which is a system biology project that I'm involved in, and also some work that we're doing with Figshare. So we saw a really nice talk yesterday, as I said, from uh, Alejandra, uh, who talked about from peer review to peer uh, reproduced. And one of the things that was underpinning uh, that work was um, actually research objects and being able to containerize them uh, down the bottom. So they were working with this um, SOAP de Novo 2 investigation uh, where they looked at how reproducible that particular kind of experiment might be. Um, the nice thing about that was it was reproducibility at the level of same data and same code. Um, and some systematic and extensible metadata collection. So that was conforming to uh, a, a profile you might think of as being the ISA file format, so that when the um, whole investigation itself was re-encoded in that format, they were actually noted that there were some errors in the original um, paper that they were able to rectify as well. So that was, that was a nice example of um, that. So I said I'd also talk a little about workflow uh, runs. Um, <coughs> so we've got this idea that a research object, you could actually capture uh, a workflow, a workflow file, uh, and also how you can actually run that. So it would include um, the kind of uh, execution environment that you ran it on, uh, the, the input data, the output data, the kind of algorithms that you used to be able to run that workflow. And that can, again, all be encapsulated into um, a research object. So then here we're promoting things like exchange, uh, reproducibility of the same data, same code, systematic and extensible metadata collection, and the other thing about um, the, the, the research object model is it can be extended. So for example, if the research object that type that you want to describe is something like a workflow or workflow run, uh, there are some extensions to the research object model which allow you to be able to extend that. And that forms, it actually forms the basis of the um, common workflow language as well. So some other work that we're doing is um, some work um, that uh, Ewan sort of alluded to uh, earlier on, which is this kind of like um, being able to share patient data, patient confidentiality data. So we've got a particular project that we're currently working with um, where we've got some layers of security where we're actually not allowed to share the data. So this is, this is uh, actually you know, getting into a level where it's not open, where we can't actually show exactly what's going on because it's patient-sensitive um, cohort data. Um, but what we can perhaps do is actually be able to surface some of the top la layers of metadata such that researchers can be able to work on them and bolt together kind of in a Lego style way analyses and cohort data in order to generate results and just see whether or not you get a similar kind of thing uh, coming out the, coming out the end. So some of that works in, involved with a, um, a, a UK uh, uh, based uh, consortium called the FAR Institutes, the FAR Commons. Uh, that's taking some NHS data uh, from repositories all around the UK and being able to surface some of that metadata via research objects. So we use research objects as the method for um, exchange uh, to be able to put that top level metadata into a central uh, aggregation uh, where um, researchers can come along and search uh, for over the data that's in those repositories that they might not ordinarily be able to get hold of. So that's promoting again exchange systematic and extensible metadata collection another Docker clang. Um, we've got uh, some work going on with Charles Vardaman and Da Huo um, at the uh, University of Notre Dame, where they are doing some work on um, the Atlas and CMS detectors um, at CERN. Thank you. And uh, 
that they're, they're doing some work where they're taking these um, virtual machines that are maybe slightly more opaque, there's kind of slightly black boxes about what's inside them, but being able to use research objects and in particular the research object manifest to describe everything about that particular Docker image and being able to sh use that as a mechanism for exchange and then publish, publish that in with a DOI into things like Zenodo. Again, it's promoting exchange, reproducibility, same codes, um, same data, and this time, same runtime environment. So we're hitting all the right buttons in the uh, scale that um, Hilmar showed, that reproducibility is not just one point, uh, it's a spectrum. Okay, um, another example I wanted to give was um, some work that was done uh, by uh, Jackie Snoop at the University of Manchester um, and, um, and uh, also works in uh, South Africa as well, uh, who's working on uh, Plasmodium falciparum, which is a particular type of parasite. And in this particular publication, uh, he references a DOI to um, a, the Seek platform. Uh, the Seek platform is a, is a, is a native uh, research object platform. Um, and you can go from that paper back to that research object platform, the Seek platform, and uh, have a look at all the full enterprise of assets that um, Jackie used uh, to be able to, to carry out that publication. So you can drill down, it takes you, it takes you to, the, to, to the platform itself and you can drill down and have a look at this, uh, for example, HK kinetic model, which is highlighted in green here. You can have a look at that and you can see that it's actually got a Mathematica notebook, like, like an IPython notebook that generates the figures as part of the paper. You can alter the parameters of that um, and change it and see what, see what it does to the research. And then you can also um, do things like from, from the, oh, I've got more time than, <laughs> than my watch is telling me. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm gonna quickly run through the last bit, but um, what that allows you to do is you can snapshot that data because you know research is an evolving process and um, uh, Jackie is actually using this platform as a, as a system for being able to capture all the work that's going on in his lab. But when he comes to a publication, he wants to say, right, now I'm, I'm gonna say, here's a DOI to ev everything that I used in, in that publication. It's not to say that my research stops here, but I want to be able to reference everything that I used in that publication. So you can export that and put it in something like Figshare and then open it up and you can go back to the links of everything that was used at that time. Okay, so then we've got things like reproducibility, systematic and extensible metadata collection, but also versioning um, of what you were doing at the time. So this goes towards this idea of fair publishing, findable, accessible, interoperable research, um, where you can uh, pack everything up as a research object, you can transport it from the seek um, you can share it with other Seek platforms, or you can public. You can use it as a mechanism for publishing to things like scientific data, as uh, Zenodo, Figshare, GitHub, GigaScience, etc. So I've talked a little bit, just in summary, I've talked a little bit about research objects and their, their, how they can support reproducibility, versioning, and exchange, and systematic and extensible metadata collection. But why does this kind of thing matter to biologists? So you know, a very naive level, you might say you publish a digital record um, and so you're sharing your scientific enterprise, you can give it to somebody else, they can in turn give you credit for it. People think all of a sudden you're a very good person and then you get a promotion, you know, so this is, this is, this is the ideal. But then you go to biologists and they say, well, okay, yeah, but what, 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 thank you, so, um, but what does it actually cost to me as a researcher? You know, because if, if it's going to make my research more awesome, then I've got to go down into this kind of dip here that I've hashed out, which is called some, in, in change, manage, change management, is kind of like this valley of despair. So you, in order to realise this time well spent, you've got to reduce that amount of time that's spent in that valley of despair so that um, researchers can actually take this Re this route towards reproducibility on, because otherwise they're gonna go, it's gonna cost me too much, I'm not gonna do it. Okay, so that's the conclusions are, uh, it's a simple solution, addressing real needs towards transparent fair principles. Uh, in terms of routes towards adoption, it's great to see the work that's going on in training. Uh, we are ourselves in the process of producing online tutorials and face-to-face -face courses. We need more tools that take advantage of research object framework and lower that cost, that technological debt towards reproducibility. 
And it would be great if we can all work together. I see that there's a number of talks that are going to be talked about in, in this session alone um, that, that, that is basically working in the same area. So, so it would be great if we can work together. All right, thank you. Thank you.